When you find the deal, the money will find you. Wow, that's powerful. That was the worst negotiation I'd ever done. Actually, we were that close from going bust. So I put an ad in the paper and, and I said something like, if you can fix my house, you can have it. What? Courage comes from certainty. Certainty comes from education. Hello and welcome to one more episode of Passionpreneur Podcast. You know, I'm super, super, super excited because today we have an amazing personality. Somebody who has grown business to six, seven, eight and multiple million dollar figure. An investor started a journey from real estate, written multiple best-selling books, featured on some really, really big platforms and, and he is one I really admire and he has the Asian roots like me as well, so I'm more connected to him. Let's welcome John Lee. John, welcome to the show. Hey brother, thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for uh, agreeing to doing this. I'm very, very excited. Um, I think ever since I started following you on uh, different platforms, and especially on Clubhouse that you're crushing it, <laughs> I really became, became your fan, and it's an honor to have you here. So, um, Let's dive into your journey because a lot of people know you as a successful entrepreneur, investor, author, and you've done a lot of things. But where did it all start? Were you like in a job? How did you get into the entrepreneurship? So my background was I was an animator. So I, I, I'm dyslexic, so I, I didn't do very well at school. I always found it very hard to, have to do math and English. And in fact, if you look at a lot of my posts and social media, <laughs> which is why I prefer to speak so I have to write, yeah. you see a lot of spelling mistakes, you'll see a lot of grammatical errors. <laughs> so I thought, what can I do? My mom always, and you know this from being an Asian background, it's like, you want to become a lawyer or an accountant or, 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 or a solicitor or a doctor. And I just wasn't smart enough to do that. So I thought, what can I do? Well, I can draw a little bit. So I you know, went to art school. Um, and then became an animator. And so as I was working in animation, and I loved the job, but it was very, very long hours. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, like you can work on a shot for about a month, mm -hmm. that's 24 frames per second. Oh, wow. And the director can say, actually, I don't like that start again. I'm like, so for me, I, I and because I worked in central London, and you know what it's like in London, it's just so busy. There's not really, we are just really existing. Mm -hmm. We're not really living. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I and, you know, my friend, because I kept complaining about my job, I would have to keep doing this, even though I, I loved it. But my friend Darren, he would always say to me, you know what, you need to do something. And then, you know, on my birthday, he bought me a book, and it was Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I read the book. And wow. I, then I discovered, book. yeah, then Legend. I discovered passive income. Mm. What, what year, year was that? That was, oh God, I think 2003. Mm. 2003. Wow, it's been 20 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So how, how did you start implementing the lessons that you learned from the book? Where did you actually start as an entrepreneur? Well, he talked about um, this whole concept of, um, I didn't even know what an asset or a liability was. Mm -hmm. Asset is something that puts money in your pocket mm -hmm. and a liability is something that takes money from your pocket. And as I started to discover, I said, well, what assets are there out there? Mm -hmm. And so the, the simplest one that most people can understand is, real estate or property, like, you know, the physical, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can smell it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, Dev, I, I wanted to learn, okay, how do I buy a piece of real estate? How do I um, acquire property? Mm -hmm. How do I make it? And, and here's the interesting thing, there's a difference between asset liability, mm -hmm. but there's actually also income producing asset. So you can also buy something which doesn't also appreciate, but it also produces the income at the same time. And that's why I found it very fascinating. I said, hold on a second. And I remember, I'll never forget this. There was a podcast I was listening. That's why I love the work that you're doing and getting this to, to the, you know, the, the passion per uh, community to learn this stuff. And you guys are getting a lot of value from all the incredible speakers. Because <laughs> okay. um, it only takes one person to be able to hear something that your guests get to say and it can make a massive ripple. And that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I was listening to an, an interview with um, an entrepreneur, property entrepreneur, um, by the name of Dolph the Roots. Mm -hmm. And he was a PhD, his doctor, he was going to all through academic, couldn't get a job. And he spent six months trying to get a job and he couldn't. And the day he got the job was when he sold a property. For The job offer that he got was 36,000. And it just so happened the property that he sold, he made 36,000. Oh, wow. So, so it's, it's like, changed. why would you want to work in a job? And I'm not saying job is bad. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's, that's how I fell into it. I thought, hold on a second. That means I can sell one property, mm -hmm. I can take the rest of the year off, 
And then next year, I just do the same thing again. Oh, wow. And so this is kind of the mentality I had. Mm, mm. So, and then you started investing your own money or you found the money to buy it or you helped people to buy the property. How, how specifically got into the investment? I actually didn't have any money to okay. invest, right? So but people listening to this, right. you don't need money to start a business <laughs> or anything. Well, this is why you need mentoring and coaching. Mm. This is why you need to get a mentor, you need to get a coach. And at the time, I, I didn't know like where to find my mentor. So I'm, again, it's through networking. Mm -hmm. So I, I literally went online. I said, you know, how to make money on, you know, on, on, on real estate. Right. And then one, one of my first courses I attended was by a guy called Ranjan Bhattacharya. Mm -hmm. And he was an incredible uh, property investor in the UK and he specifically invested in London. So I thought, hmm, maybe I can learn from something this guy. So I didn't have, I didn't, obviously you have to pay to go on these courses, right? Yes. So I said to my friends, oh yeah, I'm gonna pay this money to go. I didn't even have the money. Mm -hmm. So I went to my uncle Chi and I, I, he gave me the money to literally attend this course. Mm. And so when I attended it, I realized that, wow, think people are doing things a different way. And so when he taught me, actually, you don't need money because that was my main objection. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I wanna buy this property, but it's a million pounds. Mm -hmm. I don't have a million pounds. Mm -hmm. You know what he said to me? OPM, other people's money. And one of my other mentors, Ying Tan, and I sold my car and I paid him 10,000 pounds to basically spend two days with me. And he taught me one of the most valuable lessons, which I love to share with your community. And that is when you find a deal, the money will find you. Wow, that's powerful. Mm. And that's what led me to now building a multi-million pound property portfolio. And I still use the same concepts till today. When you find the property, you will, money will find you. Yeah, I'll give an example, right? Mm. If I came to you and I said, Okay, I've got this deal. Give me a hundred thousand. You probably wouldn't do that. So why? Yeah. But if I say, hey, I've got this deal, but there's a hundred thousand worth of equity in there, mm. that's a different story. Like when I went to my uncle to ask for money, like people a bit weird about a bit feel a bit. And you know, this Asian don't afford to buy something. Yeah. You don't have the money for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, hold on a second. I'm not asking for money, as like I'm begging for money. I'm giving you a value proposition. That's when everything changed, Dev. Like my whole mind is, oh, I don't really want to ask you for money because, you know, I might not pay you back. It's, it's a different proposition. Mm -hmm. The proposition is, I went to my Uncle Chi and I said, look, you give me the money and the first two deals that I buy, I give you 50% of the deal. That was the worst negotiation I'd ever done. Oh, really? Because he got inc two incredible deals from it, right? <laughs> but had he not loaned me the money, I wouldn't have been able no, to acquire the knowledge to do that. Cool. So it's all about value proposition like for people watching this don't you know don't be afraid to go out and 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 ask for money right instead go out and give a value proposition that's mm -hmm. what i i recommend people do so so use you use other people's money mm -hmm. you bought the property so you mm -hmm. combine your knowledge and, and which you acquired from your coaches and mentors you mm -hmm. acquired the knowledge and you acquired other people's money you combine this two and that's how you got started into property I mean, the three lessons, the th I mean, I'll share with you now, yeah. the last 20 years of yes. doing this, three most powerful lessons I learned are what allowed me to produce and build a multi-million pound property portfolio is number one, you have to make money when you buy, not when you sell. So a lot of people, they buy property for a million oh. and they'll fix it up and they'll sell it for 1.5 million. But yes. what, if the, what if the market is dropping, right? So you have to actually make money when you up buy. Front, up front. Correct. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, I asked you how much this place was. Yeah. And you know, you guys probably can't see this. There's incredible views here. But I would never buy this property at the market value. Oh. I would buy it at a discount to the market. Mm. But how would you do that? How would you find the discount? How would you Good question. That's what I asked. So the second thing is yeah. you, you never buy property from, well, not never, but if you want to get good deals, don't go to the places where everyone's looking. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would find people. I mean, literally, on the way here, a friend of mine messaged me. Said, "John, we've got this guy who wants to sell. It's worth two point five million. You can buy it at this price." I'm like, "Wow." Mm -hmm. And so, you got to find people who want to sell. But this is why you need to have your awareness. Mm -hmm. You need to tell people. I mean, people watching this are probably now sending me messages saying, "Hey, John, I sell a property. Yeah. You sell your bike with cash." And so, it's about putting the message out there. So what I call the MMM message market match whatever market that you're in you need to have the message that matches it mm -hmm. to attract the audience that you want mm -hmm. so that's how i got into real estate how i got into investments as well yeah you know in the, in the other companies i've invested in you put the message out there hey i'm looking to invest in companies in this niche this niche and this niche mm -hmm. guess what they all start coming to you mm -hmm. you gotta have a platform
Got it. How did you transition from being an investor into real estate and became an influencer? Now you're coaching and mentoring people as mm -hmm. well. How did that transition happen? It was actually the other way around. I started in real estate uh -huh. and from there went into the, the whole training space and yes. from there led into the investment space. Oh. So it was that was the journey. So I'll tell you how it happened. Mm -hmm. So people start seeing my lifestyle change, mm -hmm. living in nicer houses, you know, driving nicer cars, being on a holiday, people check my social media, and they're always asking me like, oh, are you not working as an animator anymore? No, because here's the thing, I never really told people what, what I was gonna do as well. Mm -hmm. What I found was too many negative people. Mm -hmm. Like you tell people what, what you wanna do, and they'll say, oh, you can't do that, and they'll start giving you all the reasons on why, you, why, why you'll fail, I, and I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know what, let me just do this thing myself, Right, because that's what I did, and you know this. Like, you start, you want to inspire people. Yeah. You get excited about it. You start telling people about it. And what happens? They go, mm, yeah. maybe you should stick to your. Know, be realistic, <laughs> right? And so, because they don't have the experience, and yeah. this is why your circle is so important when you hang around people. Mm -hmm. So, a part of me thought to myself, you know what? Let me just do this. I won't tell anyone what I do but I'll let my actions make all the noise. Mm. I'll let my results make all the noise. And then people start saying to me, hey, hey how, how do you buy this property stuff? Or oh, I'm looking to buy property in London. Like, do you think I should buy it? Do you think I should sell? Hey, I'm paying off my mortgage. Like, mm. what do you think this is a good idea or bad idea? By the way, you should never. In my opinion, I think paying off your mortgage is the worst strategy, especially if you can do more with that money, mm -hmm. all right? So people started asking me about it. They would come to our, you know, my, my house. Because I, I would do one, I would literally go to people's houses, they'd make me coffee and I'd sit down with them and coach them. That person would teach other people. And then before one turned to two, two turned to four and turned to 50. And as you've seen me speak on stage with thousands Thousand and thousands people, of people yeah. right, right now. So that's why I think it's always about getting a message and creating your network. Because in today's society, it's not about competition anymore, it's about collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how you started creating content on property first? Yeah, if you look back at my YouTube channel, yeah. <laughs> you'll see my first video I put up in 2008. Uh -huh. And it was all about how to get deals from estate agents. Because uh -huh. that's one of the places you ask me where you can find deals. If you go to the right agents, mm -hmm. you become good friends, mm -hmm. um, they give you some, some interesting deals. I mean, some of the multi-million pound deals that I've bought have come from agents actually. Got right? It. But that's when you start building a brand. But you need to have multiple different um, outlets. So mm -hmm. for me, by starting on, on, on YouTube, YouTube was like, oh, I mean, you've got an incredible YouTube channel as well that you, know, you should all subscribe to if you're not already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's about getting the awareness. So when I was putting these videos out, people were like, who's this John Lee guy, mm -hmm. right? And then I would get a call. And, and, the, and most of the calls, I'd ask them the question, because I felt, because I did newspaper advertising, read the old Google AdWords, but do you know what was interesting? Because back then, mm -hmm. social media was just starting. Yeah, a lot of people are not aware about they that. They wasn't yeah. aware about it. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, hmm, I put this video up, and I think at the time it had like a thousand views. You know, not, not compared to the views I get, I get you know, nowadays. I yeah. mean, still, the algorithm's changing, and a lot of videos, some do and some don't. But I would ask people, oh, how did you find me? Oh, I saw a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, hmm, that's it didn't cost me any money to put that on there. Mm -hmm. Let me put another one up. Sure enough. I, I found a direct correlation to the more that I post, the more my phone would ring. Interesting, interesting. Now, a lot of people watching this, you know, I, I, you know, they may have the question that, oh, you know what, John Lee could do it. He, it would have been a cakewalk for him. It would have been a smooth for him. What is the dark side of entrepreneurship? Was there like tough times? A lot of tough times. Um, things that you think are gonna work, um, work for a while, then they stop working. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to adapt to the market. Because here's, here's the thing, Dev. The market is forever changing, especially if you're in the Web3 space, yeah. in the social media space, the online space, the, especially the crypto space. Yeah. It's always changing. So things that used to work and be super profitable suddenly became unprofitable. Mm. Right, like like one of the companies, especially in the pandemic, like we did a lot of like physical events. You probably felt this. Yeah. I know you've done the same yeah. as well. Yeah. Like suddenly, people can't go to an event anymore. That means people have paid for tickets. You pay for a hotel. So, you sell thousands of tickets. Yeah. You can't deliver. What happens then? So, so you, you have to adapt to the market. Sometimes I buy a property deals. Some are really good, and some are not good. Some cost me money. Some make me a lot of money. Sometimes you get into investments that at the time sounds like a really good investment and the, the founders are like so passionate 
you know, and you haven't done your research, they don't even have a deck, they've not got no team, they have no projections, and you're like, hmm, that's interesting. Sometimes it's with business partners. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can be with business partners and, you know, they can be great for a number of, of years and then, you know, until you're not useful anymore or things happen in, in the yeah, organization. Yeah, you're part ways. Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, it's, do, do you remember any, any lowest time of your life in business specifically that you can share that, you know, this was the time and how did you come out of it? Because I think what, you are a big believer in having a great mindset because if you don't have the mindset, you don't have anything. I was there in you know, your two-day mastermind. I was blow, blown away with the mindset piece that you share with the people. And I also written a book called 80% Mindset, 20% Skills. I'm a big believer of mindset as well. So was there any specific incident that you can you know, share with the audience that was very lowest moment of your life? And how did you come out of that in terms of your thought process and mindset? Oh, I mean, there's so many. And it, it happens <laughs> quite regularly as an entrepreneur. So anyone who hasn't been through those moments, yeah. you know, hasn't really got that... that sort of experience. I mean, now when things happen, of course, I've got 20 years of experience behind me, so now it's much easier to manage, but mm -hmm. when right at the start, mm -hmm. for example, um, 2008, what happened? You had the whole subprime mortgages, yeah, everything, worldwide recession. Yeah. And again, what things that used to work that did not work, like the way I was buying property, I was buying millions of dollars worth of property. Mm -hmm. And because there was a, a specific way to finance them, now I'm like, okay, well, I've, I've basically created a money printing machine here, so I got cocky. I thought, okay, good, let's just buy, keep buying more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Financing stops. Mm -hmm. So when financing stops, you cannot know, acquire more assets. True. So what happens with that? No assets, no cash. No cash, your cash flow is now affected. Mm -hmm. So remember there was, uh, there was a time where I, I'd buy these properties and instead of the properties making money now, because have you ever played the game Monopoly? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, you got the, you got the kids, right. You got it right there, right. <laughs> so you know when you you got you, you got you know you buy all these houses and you can turn these green houses yes. into hotels, yes. and you get that card that says you must repair all of your properties. Hmm. That basically happened to me. Wow. Literally, we were that close from going bust. Okay. Wow. I don't think I've ever shared this story before. Really? I, I can share it now because I've got so many years' experience behind yes. it. Yes. Um, so this is exclusive for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was a time where, like, the properties were, were because I sometimes, and here's a mistake I made, I'd buy properties too fast mm -hmm. because I found a way to finance them. I was like, I was just buying anything, mm -hmm. right? So some were good and some were really bad. Some needed a lot of work, which required a lot of cash flow. Some needed um, a lot of um, renovations in there as well. And it just, I started running out of cash. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? I've got to think of a way to do this. Hmm. Right, and you find a way for people to be able to buy these properties, but at the time, no one's buying. So going into 2008 is where I picked up a lot of deals, but the subsequent years after that, even though I was acquiring a lot of deals, I was making a lot of like cash. Sometimes I was selling them, I was buying low, selling low. It got to a point where everything just stopped. Wow. Right, tenants weren't paying. All of your, you know, repair all your houses, roof, like floods happen and insurance companies not, not paying out. Wow. You've got team members move, uh, leaving because you can't afford to pay them. Mm -hmm. So who's left? Me, right? And my PA. Wow. And I'll never forget this, Dev. There was five of my properties that were just not making money, right? And I had to go and get them to make money. So what did I do? I had to come up with creative ways first. So... And I tried to sell them, no one was buying it, so I had to figure out a different way to get people to buy. So I put an ad in the paper and, and I said something like, if you can fix my house, you can have it. What? Right, if you can fix my house, you can have it. And I, there was this one property that was costing me like, I think it was at the time, it was like 850 pounds a month. Mm -hmm. And it was empty, because someone had turned that property into a cannabis factory. Wow. Right, so I rented it out, they dilapidated the entire property, and the, the walls were damp and there was like, like mold everywhere because yeah. what they did is they, 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 they put the, the plants in that's like suspended sprinklers right. so the, the things would grow, oh, yeah. right? And it was just horrible. The house was in, in literally that house was um, valued at a quarter of a million, right? And they just messed it up. So there's about 120,000 pounds worth of damage in that. Wow. So don't forget, I've got damage in the property and now... I've got to service the mortgage. Mm. But with everything going on, it was really tight. The cash flow was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. That's why anyone listening to this now, you've got to diversify. That's my first lesson, that diversification, right? So that's, I had to be creative. And then the other ones that was, um, ones that I, I couldn't rent out, I was like how, like, how am I gonna 
rent these out. So I did something, I came up with this, this idea called a rent to buy. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, well, if you can rent my property, then I'll, then, then I'll give it to you. Wow. Right? That's interesting. Because if you, cause what I, my main purpose was to get rid of the debt because mm -hmm. the asset now became a liability. Yeah. yeah. So it's I thought, taking well, money from you now. Correct. So if I can say, let, let's say, okay, let, I, I can get dev to go and pay that, you know, $500, $1,000 a month. That means I don't have to. Don't forget, you've got five properties to unlet now. Mm -hmm. Each one, $500 to $1,000 around that range. Yes. Okay. Like, you just can't, so there's not enough cash flow coming in mm -hmm. because I depleted a lot of the cash as well with renovations. It's very cash intensive. Mm -hmm. So that was a really low point for me. And I had to personally go out. I remember driving to Sheffield with my PA and... Well, I'd literally print out all these leaflets, about two or 3,000 leaflets, mm -hmm. and I would split them with her, and we'd just go around every single house putting leaflets through the door saying, if you, if you rent to buy, because one of the properties that was really bad was in Sheffield, mm -hmm. and I had to get rid of it. So I was, I was putting these leaflets through people's doors, hey, if you can rent my property, you can buy it. I tried every single angle. That's how I got good at marketing, because mm -hmm. I knew what worked and what didn't work. If I put call John, I'd, I wouldn't get any calls. If I put call Samantha, she'd get a lot of calls. So putting a female name on that leaflet would increase the conversion. Interesting. Right? So we had all these, but that was a really low point for me because it was just like I'd made all this money, then I'd deplete a lot of the cash, and then the cash flow started to suffer as well. Mm. So had I not done that, and just, it was just, I don't know what it was, but I, I learned some very valuable lessons there. Like how, how did you control your, did you, you know, do something for your mindset or like go 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 fix it fix it i had no choice uh-huh do whatever it takes well, literally attitude uh, you have to like get in the car drive i don't care what it is i can't afford to pay someone to leave i'm gonna leave it myself mm. by the way this is the time where i built like uh, th th at the time i think the, the portfolio was like less than 10 million then mm -hmm. right but but still it was like even though you're acquiring a lot of debt if people are not servicing the debt you're in trouble mm. right if people are not, um, if you're not selling property, you're also in trouble because you would actually separate it. You would separate some of the portfolio you buy and sell mm -hmm. to create lump sums of cash. And then you would rent the properties out to create cash flow. Mm. So you have cash and you have cash flow. So even though it worked, I was just bad at managing it. Mm. I didn't have a CFO, mm -hmm. didn't have anyone to do finances. So of course, you know, you sell a property, you make all this money, you go and buy a car with it, you just yeah. blow it on stuff. Yeah. That's when I realized I need to do something with money. That's how I came into investing. Mm, got it. Interesting. What advice would you give to people who are looking to start their business, but they are not able to muster the courage, whether it's real estate, whether it's coaching, whether it's marketing themselves, or whatever it is that they want to do, but they're not able to muster the courage? Courage comes from certainty. Certainty comes from education. The more educated, like if I said, like you, you and I were talking about people jumping out of planes, yes. right? You and I would never jump out of a plane by ourselves the first time, would we? For sure. We just never would. <laughs> but yet, Dev, that is how people operate their business. You know what? Let me try it myself first. And then if I succeed, then I'll come to you. No. The way you get around this, and there's three things that I realized. Number one, you got to have the right knowledge. Mm -hmm. So have the right knowledge and learn. Right? That's why I love about, that's why you're so successful at what you do. Because, you know, even though you're doing so well, you still will learn. That's yeah. when I now speak to my team. I was like, you know, Dev, he's, he's going to do this. He's going to get to the next level because you Thanks. invest in your education. So you've got to have the right knowledge. Second is strategy. Your strategy will change every eight to 10 years, right? And you will have to rebrand and reinvent every five to seven years because the market changed and probably now even quicker. Mm. So you've got to the right strategy depending on your business model. Like I give an example. You look at Nespresso. Mm -hmm. Right, and espresso, the machine used to break down all the time, mm -hmm. right? And they'd have to be recalled. So their business model almost went bankrupt. Why? Purely because of the fact that there was had so much hardware, you know, physical things going out. So how did they fix it? They would recall all the machines, send them back out as a renew machine, now with little capsules. Mm -hmm. Little capsules now have a subscription model to it. So now that's how they make a lot of what we call um, ARR, annual recurring revenue. Right. So you gotta look at business models and the strategy will change. Mm -hmm. right? That's why you see everyone going from web two to now web three, yeah. with the launch of now AI softwares, right? You know, you all the chat GPTs, all the, like literally the other day I was like, okay, draw me something. Uh, draw me a car with wings. You would not believe it. I'll show you the picture a little bit really? later. The, the, the car was insane. It looked like something futuristic that you would never, you could never dream up. 
right? Now people don't know how to make a website. You draw on paper, you put it into, you, you scan it into AI or create a website for you. Wow. Exactly how like you've drawn it, Wow. right? You, I want to replace my face with your face. I can map your face onto me. You want me to speak like you, I can do voice cloning on, on my, your voice on me and my voice on you. Interesting. There's just so much at play here. And that's what I'm talking about. Strategy has to change. Mm -hmm. And the last one is implementation, right? The more you implement, the more you know what not to do. So you talk about mindset. Yeah. How did I learn this stuff? Before it was like, oh, why is this stuff happening to me? Like the world's not fair. And you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm basically playing victim. Yes. And the sooner you can get out of becoming a victim yeah. and taking ownership of that and saying, you know what? This is happening to me, but how can I influence it? You, you don't know whether it's gonna, you know, you, you can't control the weather sometimes, yeah. right? You can't control whether the, you know, traffic lights can be red or green, you just can't control that stuff. Yeah. What you can control is how you feel. And what you can, can, can control are certain things based on having a knowledge set with that. Mm -hmm. So like, I know a lot of people ask me, oh John, should I trade cryptocurrencies? I say, well, do you have the knowledge? Right? Have you been, have you gone on any courses? Right? What's have you tested the market? Have you have you done an MVP in that? And so how can you do MVP? Well, take a little budget, and if you blow it, it's not going to affect you. What people do, they take the whole account, put it in there, blow it, and that's well, it, they're yeah. gone. And that also without the education. Yeah. <laughs> right. They sh if they didn't that's not investing. That's gambling. Correct. Mm. Correct. Mm. Let's let's talk about the marketing because I think you're you're a marketing genius, right? And I love the strategies that you come up with. The two days blew my mind. Though I was doing this, um, what advice would you give to people who are small entrepreneurs who are not understanding how the marketing actually works? Like, do you have like principles or uh, tips that you can share with those people how they can market themselves? Because if people don't know you they cannot buy from you, mm. right? So what are, what are your golden lessons that you can share with them? In I know you have an ocean of knowledge, but if you can summarize it to the small one. All right, so let me try and summarize those two days that we spent together. Yeah. All right, um, the first thing is really important. You have to be consistent. So you heard me on Clubhouse, mm -hmm. right? How many times were on Clubhouse? Oh, every day. Every day, every right? Every day. That's how I built almost a million followers on Clubhouse. Yeah. Right? Because every single day, I was going to talk about different things that people go, well, John, I don't have as much time as you. Well, good news is now you, the systems and processes, you can do it autopilot. Yeah. Right? So, so the first thing is you've got to be consistent, right? The second thing is knowing what technologies are available. Mm -hmm. For example, there are softwares now where I can take a voice and I can replay it over and over and over again. There are videos like this that I can take and then I can replay that over and over and over and over again. So, and, and the softwares that can write things for you, that can write articles. So one of the strategies for marketing is what I call the WAV strategy, W-A-V. W-A-V, just mm -hmm. easy for you guys watching this to learn. Mm -hmm. So W stands for written, mm -hmm. right? When you put written content, I have a friend who gets 10 million in, like, views on a website every single week just using articles. So now you can write a lot of articles very fast yeah. <laughs> using a lot of different AI softwares and of course, outsourcing and having articles as well. So when you're using written content, you wanna put as much content out there as possible so people read your articles. Because not everybody wants to be on camera, not everybody's good at podcasting, so write it. You can go to ChatGPT now and say, let's say you've got a supplement in, in, in company. Mm -hmm. Write me an article on why people need to take supplements to become more healthy. And it will just write it for you. Then you can syndicate it on a lot of different platforms. So you start ranking a lot of the articles, especially LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn articles now, newsletters, they have distribution and push notification. That means if you have a thousand connections, every time you make a post, it'll push it out to a thousand people. So your engagement rate goes higher. Now that may change, but at the time of this, there'll be something even better, Yeah. right? But written is one way you can go. Audio is another way you can go. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of the social media platforms, the social audio platforms, podcasting, right? You know, if you guys ever get invited to podcast, do it, yeah. right? Because, you know, a lot of people will watch this over the years to come. True. Right? So, and that's why I call net activity. You know, people talk about passive income. Mm -hmm. No one really talks about passive effort. Passive effort. Passive effort. This passive is passive effort. effort. I do this once and this will replay over and over and over and over again. And then I'll, I'll ask you and your team to send me the raw files. Yeah. I'll send that to my team and they'll cut that into a thousand different pieces of content mm. to be put on social media, mm -hmm. right? So the second thing is 
when you understand the technologies, third is you've got to be omnipresent. So you've got to be everywhere. And so, for example, we do Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Google, Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse, TikTok. There's all these different, um, I mean, there's going to be more and more that, that, you know, that'll be added to that. Google, Google Play as well. Mm -hmm. But when you take content, you need awareness. So marketing is all about awareness. I see you times attention, I have to consume you, equals income. Because like you said, mm. like how many times you've been shopping before, you had no intention of buying anything, but yet you came home with bags of shopping. That's true. Right? So many Be times. Because we were browsing, because browsers turned to buyers. Yes. But nowadays it's very different. Nowadays, like when I speak around, I think that's, you know, I was at an event, you came to me and said, oh, John, I heard you on Clubhouse. Yeah. That happens a lot when I'm mm. shopping or when I'm at the airport. So if I'm walking in a cafe, you know, people will recognize you and they'll see the work that you do. That's a and I'm sure you effort. get that a lot as well, right? Yeah. It's passive yeah, I effort. Doing that, yeah. Right? So you do that and people recognize you in all different parts of the world. You know, so now it becomes global awareness. Mm. Now it doesn't matter where you are. And I, I always have this joke, like if I got stranded somewhere with no money and nothing, and all I had was my mobile phone, I would make one person say, hey, I just lost my wallet. I'm stranded in this area. Can someone come to the hotel or come to this location? And within an hour, someone would come. Mm. I want to do that as a social experiment, actually. <laughs> I want to try that as a social, 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 social experiment. <laughs> It'll be we fun. should do episode, should do episode two of, <laughs> of this, <laughs> see if it works. <laughs> Reality TV. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I always joke about that, but it, it, it's so true because marketing really is about distribution and marketing is about creating demand. But here's the thing, mm -hmm. it's what people don't understand. If you want to create a brand, you must first create demand. And let me tell you the issue right now. You have some thought leaders, I won't mention any names, but you'll know who I'm talking about. Some thought leaders that say, don't sell anything, just put out great content and be yourself, be authentic, which I agree with. Mm. And then you have the other thought leaders that will say, don't do that stuff, it's a waste of time, sell from day one because <laughs> you can make money and you start monetizing. You know who I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. These, these two thought leaders. Yeah. And I sit there and I think, hmm, I understand this person because I get that it's all about building brand, but it's kind of like a lot of the influencers out there. Mm. There's a lot of broke influencers out there, isn't oh, wow, there? That's They've so got true. millions of followers that's that don't so make true. any money. That is so true. Right? So but true. what if you do the other side and you're always selling all the time? People are, oh, yeah, that person's a scammer. Yeah. They're just trying to sell yourself all the time. Yeah. So I get both of it. So I have a solution. Yeah. And a friend of mine, Paul, taught me this. So Paul, if you're watching this, you give me the credit <laughs> for this. And he said to me, the, the balance in between, right, is to market in public and sell in yeah, private. private. Yeah, when I, when I heard this term in the session, I was like, wow, this is really beautiful. And I was doing that knowingly, unknowingly, some part of it, but I said, man, I need to do that more, right? Would you want to explain a little more, like what, is, what does this concept mean? Like, Okay, so, so for example, if, if I went, okay, let's call this thought leader one, mm -hmm. right? Thought leader one says you keep selling all the time, so, in between, in this podcast, I'll be like, okay, go to my website, go to here, go to this URL, da, da, da. It yeah. becomes like people won't want to listen, right? Because yeah, they're, they're trying to sell all the time. Yeah. But on the flip side, thought leader number two is, okay, let's just give as much value. Like you asked me a question, I know we have limited time. Mm. I want to give as much value as I can on your podcast to mm. respect the, the, the viewer's time to make their time worth watching, sure. right? So you have these two spectrums. Yeah. Now, what are people going to do? After they watch this, they're going to go to Google, Go's they're going to go to johnny.com, yeah. they're going to go to my social media, they're going to go to your social media, you'll tag me in the post, mm -hmm. they'll get in touch with my team and say, when's John next in this country, in USA, in London, in Dubai, in, in, in uh, Malaysia, Singapore, right? And so that creates the demand. Mm. And so they'll call my office, they'll send an email to my team or they'll drop me, a, me an email, mm. right? And they'll say, hey, John, I heard you on Dev's podcast um, about this. I would love to learn how this works. Like, I've got a very simple email, john at johnlee.com. <laughs> it's very, very easy, Perfect. right? Yeah. You know, people ask me so funny, you know, I go to these networking events, they say, have you got a card? I said, no, my email is very simple. It's my name, yeah. john at johnlee.com. John, simple, it can't be simpler than it that. It can't be simpler than that. And they go, yeah, I get that, right? So like people will, like, will, will, will watch these things and they'll, 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 they'll send me an email. Oh, John, I really resonated with what you said there. Um, you know, how, how can we, you know, move forward? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes people will say, well, John, I've got my company. We're about to do a, a, a Series A, a pre-seed on this. Can you help me get the funding? Because mm. a lot of my friends are VCs in Silicon Valley and, you know, a lot of people, 
come to me for, for, for like funding, mm -hmm. right? So if it's a good project, by the way, don't email me lots of nonsense. <laughs> you gotta email me a deck if you're gonna email me, right? So yeah, I mean, that, that's how a lot of the business comes. So this is why it's two spectrums of it. And I, and I agree with both of them, but the sweet spot is where, it's, is, is where as I explained. I love that, I love that. That term is really, really beautiful. Um, so let's now segue to the passion and the fulfillment side of life. So you, you've been very successful, right? You build multiple businesses, um, you're talking on different stages, you're empowering so many people. What gives you the satisfaction and joy in your life? One word, impact. 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 Do you know, like, a lot of my friends complain about me, like, I work too much. Even my, my, <laughs> my, my team keep asking me to slow down. <laughs> she's looking at me now. She's looking at me now. The CEO always right? staring. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, and she's like, John, you need to sleep. John, you need to rest. And like, we're at meetings before we came here. We just like, had a meeting with a very, very big company. He's like, oh, we need to go now, we need to go now. And she's like, I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful I have an incredible team who sure. keep me on track and keep me sane. Mm -hmm. And my thought process is like, I always want to do things that I love to do. Mm. Even if I didn't get, like people ask me, John, how do you find your passion? Mm. It's one simple question you want to ask. If you didn't get paid to do what you do, would you still do it? I don't know, you would. Even yeah. if you get paid to do what you do, you would still do I this, still do it, yes. right? Because you've got passion. And so that's why it's never about how much money you're going to make. Mm. It's never about, oh, I want to be a millionaire, billionaire. Like, it's actually, you have to fall in love with the process. The secret formula to finding passion is to fall in love with the process. Mm. And that is a double-edged sword, because you just never stop working, yeah. right? It's just like one, I mean, you know, being in, like, in, in places like this, yeah. you're networking, it's like one meeting after meeting after another meeting, it's like, and it's like, you have meetings like 3 a.m. in the morning, it's like, it's crazy. Yeah. Because we are passionate about what we do, yeah. and we fall in love with the process, yeah. and we're always learning, that for me is, is and I always say this, there's no such thing as uh, work-life balance, but, but work-life integration. You have to integrate what you're doing into your life. That's why... Not the balance, but the integration. You have to integrate it. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, when, when, you know, when I finish events and we do all this networking, we say, okay, let's go back to the suite and we mastermind. That, oh. that's, that's my way of chilling out. Chilling. <laughs> and do, 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 <laughs> that's a very cool way of chilling, actually. Do you know, do you know, in, in our suites here, right? We're probably the only people that have a flip chart in our suites, and you, you ask it, you, you, like, I'll show you a picture later. And so it. we have our pens, and we and we and we we're doing all, all the mapping things out because yeah. we want to take what we learned, the knowledge yeah. strategy, with implementation. I love it. The difference between people who are successful and successful is implementing it right away. Mm, I love it. I love it, and I can resonate with every word you're saying about the passion because I think more or less. I am also like that. Um, I also have a podcast at, at 12.30 in the midnight today with uh, John Lee Dumas. <laughs> and uh, I, I go nonstop, you know, working some time and I don't get, get burned out. I recently I saw one, one lady who was an influencer who started in 2018 like me. You know, I started with the one purpose, I want to impact lives. Like the impact word, transformation is very close to my heart as well. Mm -hmm. Like I come from a very small, humble family. My dad was a truck driver. I worked in a job for 16 years, did not know what to do in life. I realized I was suffering from mediocrity. Like my goals, my ambitions, my dreams were all mediocre. Mm. And I had this mind shift, the book that changed your life. Um, my, the book that changed my life was The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone, who mm. has been in your room, good mm. friend of yours as well. Um, I connected with that story and, and 10X Rule blew my mind. And then I rich dad, poor dad, and I started following all this. Now it actually drives me, you know, uh, this is the drive that, man, I want to help people to find their passion and convert that into business. So impact, transformation, they are my words as well. So I can resonate with this. If you're, if you're watching this, without passion, without, I think, the, the joy of giving back and impacting lives. That is huge. Do you yeah. know one thing, like, the amount of people that walk up to me and say, John, I read that one thing that you said, or I kept hearing you on Clubhouse, or I saw that post, or I watched that YouTube video, and because of that, it started that ripple effect in their life. And I had someone the other day, said, because of you, I've, I've bought my first property. Mm. And this person's what, in, the, in their 20s, early 20s, getting on the property ladder in London is very hard, mm -hmm. you know? And, but yet to give them the strategies to, to I, I wouldn't want anyone to go through the stuff that we've been through over the, over the many decades. Yeah. Like, it's, it, like entrepreneurship is so hard, mm. right? It's so, so hard. There's sure. so much. I always say that, do you know how athletes, they train, they have a coach mm -hmm. and they're training every day. 
right? I almost think that entrepreneurs, why I talk a lot about mindset as well, is entrepreneurs need to have that level of thought process and training and warm-ups before they get into the game uh, as well. Yes. So and that's why when you're passionate about something, something interesting happens. Mm-hmm. Our mind can't tell whether we are stressed out or they were excited. It's almost the same feeling. Oh, there is no difference. There's, well, I mean, so my good friend, you know Jim Quick. Jim he's, Quick he's yes. a good friend. He, yes. he taught me this. He said, you should, bro, you shouldn't say it. Like I always say to him, bro, I can't remember people saying, he said, bro, don't say that. We're at dinner together. He said, don't say that. I said, why? He says, so your mind doesn't know if it's true or false. Mm-hmm. So for me, the reason I'm so passionate about what I do, and again, it, when I'm working, it doesn't feel like I'm working. Like, you know, you will go out for dinner, we'll, we'll master my ideas, and hey, you know, come to my show, come do a gig here, come do a podcast. I literally was doing a podcast the other day, mm-hmm. an interview. Mm-hmm. And in that meeting, I found out this guy was one of the, he was working with one of the biggest TV networks on the planet. If I name them now, I can't say it now because it's quite sensitive, but if I tell you, you, you would know what that company was. And that company that he was mentioning what he's doing and now he's tokenizing and he's taking it to the next level. And I thought, wow, I've got context that could really help you. Like you're talking about someone who on the spot could potentially raise a lot of money because I had another contact there. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes it's, the network becomes your net worth. It's the people that you hang around. It's, it's the people that you're able to bring to the table, mm. right? Because you and I don't know everything, yeah. but we know people who know people, Sure. right? Sure. And so, for example, if you don't, like we, we were saying this morning, if you don't have a good leader or a good CEO or a good CEO, well, right? You can bring all these people together, mm-hmm. right? So it, that's why the team is so important. It's not just, it's not just a CEO. You've got to have a great MD. You've got to have a great CTO, CFO, especially, you know, if, you, if those people who are moving into that Web3 space as well. Like yeah. you, you've really got to have and start focusing on yourself mm. and bring people smarter than you into your company. I always say this stuff, you're the smartest person in your company, you're gonna go broke pretty quick. <laughs> for sure, yeah. for sure. Where is the future for business? What are the exciting opportunities that you know, you're like, man, I can't wait to do this or okay. get to this. I'm glad you asked me this question because the meeting I just came from <laughs> was about that. Yeah. And this is a massive company. Mm-hmm. So right now, um, you had, if you look at all the growths of how things are, you know, you know dot com boom, right? And yes. then it boom and bust. Yeah. Then you had the real estate coming. Then you had the early ways of crypto. Yeah. Then you had Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah. So funny, a friend of mine was telling me um, this morning that he went to one of these conferences many years ago. And he, um, he you know, when, when you go there, they give you one Bitcoin, right? Oh, like yeah. a C phrase. You know, when you get the goodie bags tokens, of things in yeah, it, tokens, yeah, yeah. tokens. And yeah. he, he, obviously, that was one Bitcoin. Yeah. Just threw it away, right? That was back then, right? Knowing what is known now. So here's where I think the market's going to be moving. Here's, here's my prediction mm-hmm. Web 2, which, you know, the big Amazons, you know, the, 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 the Facebooks, the, all the Web 2 companies, right? But then you've also got Web 3 which is the metaverse, mm-hmm. right? I don't think we're there yet. We're going to be a little while till we get there. I mean, things are moving quick. So depending on when you're watching this, it could be 10 years from when you're watching this, <laughs> then you'll know what I'm saying, but this is the prediction. Right now, we're right bang, bang, bang in the middle, Web 2.5, right? So what's happening now is you have the rise. I mean, you look at what happened to all the banks recently as well. Yeah. yeah? You look at all the you know, crypto psh, psh, like this. Um, that was the first wave of adoption, mm-hmm. right? All the, you know, really smart people coming in, programming, doing things, but it kind of like, that was like a test phase. That was kind of like alpha, mm. okay? So we did the alpha test of this whole movement. Um, next wave, okay, where we're coming to right now, and you look at what happened with, again, people getting bailed out and things like that. Um, it's gonna be mass adoption now, mass adoption. So, for example, and when I'm, talk, I'm talking about the Web3 space, yep. right? I'm talking about um, fiat money being converted into digital currencies. Mm. Um, the general public, the masses, or what that industry refers to us and people in this room as normies. Mm-hmm. The normies will drive mass adoption to that market, and a lot of businesses that understand it very, very well, that's why you heard me talking about this the other day in, in, yes. in, in the two-day last time we ran together, that is going to be the growth of everything. Give an example. When people buy your products right now, they buy it with fiat money, right? Yes. So pounds, dollars, euros, whatever, Rupees, right? Yeah. What if Dev had a Dev coin, 
mm -hmm. right? And that dev coin was basically a point system. So every time they pay, say, $1,000 for a program, they come see you, come speak at an event, and you speak for thousands of people, right? You see, right now, they're only buying a ticket, and they only get dev for that session, which is great, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, you invested in it into the two days, you know, $2,000, you only get those two days. That's it. Mm -hmm. What if you, when you invest that 2000 right, it now becomes you get a part of my points, Right, so you start getting some John Lee points, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because now when other people start buying those points, the whole ecosystem shifts up. It's like supply and demand. Wow, the valuation right? of the points and those things go higher. But it's, it's all supply and demand. Mm. Like, let's say this property, right? Yeah. You've got an incredible view, a lot of people are gonna wanna buy this. Yeah. So there's gonna be more supply, sorry, more demand than there's supply. There's only so many units that have this view. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. Can they charge more for it? Of course, because it's more people want more people want to buy it. It's the same with stock. Mm -hmm. When more people buy stock, when there's more buzz around a stock, it starts to move up. So this is why you tell me where markets are moving. You have to start, and everyone watching this right now, you have to start building community. That's why I love what you what you're doing with the podcast. You've yeah. got a strong community. Mm -hmm. Now, when when okay, I'll give you another example. You look at how much Bitcoin was. 20 years, well, 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay, what well, you could buy it for like 10 bucks. Yes. Some people were trading Bitcoins for pizzas. Yeah, that's right. right. Now you look at the market, it's gone up a lot. Mm. So actually the goal is to find a lot of these types of things, right? They're called layer ones. Mm. Bit, like, well, Bitcoin's not really because that's more of a holding an asset, but like Ethereum, Solana, like these are layer ones, yes. right? So you could build your layer one, but it'll cost you, you know, some money and you're going to have the expertise to do that. Or you can piggyback on, on another one, mm -hmm. right? That's why they talk about this whole concept of tokenomics. Mm -hmm. So tokenomics is I'm buying tokens into dev, right? And the more tokens I buy, the more benefits I get. Got so it. let's say, for example, I want to go out to dinner with dev. I want to come into his beautiful apartment and I want to have dinner with a mastermind. You might charge a lot of money for that normally one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. But if people hold a certain amount of Points. Coins or in your or points, points, we yeah. call these points, right? Yeah. So let's say I have a million points. I've spent a million, um, w w you know, w with you, for example. Let's say it's like you know one dollar a point. Yes. I now get extra benefits of that. I can mm. tour with you. I can travel to India with you. I can, I can sit down for dinner with you. I can get introductions with you. But there's only a limited amount. Mm. So if you have like a thousand dollars, right? So someone pays you a thousand dollars in fiat, in pounds. Euros, USD, yeah. but now I'm buying it in points, in your points. Yeah. I'm now not only getting the service from you, but when everybody else starts buying, it all starts to move up. Wow, that is very powerful. I think a lot of people, you have to rewatch it again <laughs> to understand what exactly, how valuable this knowledge is. Very, very powerful. I know we, are, you know, we, we have right on the time, <laughs> And I don't want to take more time of yours. You're very busy coming up meeting after meeting. Uh, but one piece of advice you want to give to people who are in the business, uh, any piece of advice you want to give to them? Stay humble. Mm. Always watch your cash flow and treat people like you want to be treated. I know so many people in this industry. And don't get me wrong. We sometimes lose our rag because we have a lot of pressure. But most of the times, just be nice. Mm. Help people. Yeah. And don't expect anything back. Do you know at the very top level, based on that whole world I was telling you, the top 1%, the Silicon Valleys, you know, people at MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Berkeley, all like the Ivy Leagues. Like the, the reason why a lot of the unicorns come out of Stanford and from that part of the world mm -hmm. is because that entire world operates based on relationship capital. It's not based on, oh, you want my time? You've got to pay me money. Mm -hmm. Because if I help you with an idea, let's say you've got a deck, yeah. and that deck helps you raise 20 million for your company, and then you IPO with that. Do you think you're gonna give me some allocation? Mm. Of course you will. Yeah. That's how I'm getting a lot right. of allocations, a lot of companies that I'm gonna advise them. I get a tiny amount, mm -hmm. but if you'd invested a tiny amount in a company that's an Apple or a Netflix or a Google, like, or a ChatGPT, yeah. that yeah. can suddenly become very, very, I have a friend, a business partner of mine, she invested in Solana at seven cents. And you know, now it's yes. gone, I mean, at one point it peaked uh, quite a lot, it's come, come down a lot now, mm. but you gotta get in early. So instead of you, and this is a big piece of advice, this is what my mentor taught me. And she said to me, John, you should not go out and try and get access to the deals that are already there, right? So don't go out and 
catch the unicorns, right? Instead, you need to hunt the unicorns. Mm. There's a very big difference. Because don't if catch I catch it, hunt it. Yeah, I don't want to go and catch it. There's all these people I want to yeah, catch yeah, it. Yeah. I want to hunt it. If I'm sitting there and go, oh my God, like this is why these meetings, I'm speaking to this guy. This guy's an incredible operator, but knows nothing about Web3. Okay, let me go and speak to some tokenomic experts. Okay, you guys create the to tokenomics. Okay, great. So you need C round. Okay, it's going, uh, let's go to um, a VC, right? So now when I'm hunting, mm -hmm. I'm looking at talent. And that's why all the youngsters now, like, you know, they, they call them DGens. DGens. Right? DGens, right? The DGens are like, constantly 24 hours learning all this stuff. So if you can get a DGen, right? You find all the youngsters, like, you know, that your 15 year olds, your 18 year olds, your 20 year olds, your 19 year olds, these are the next generation. You need to spot the talent. And my job now is to spot all these talents and then put them all together and wrap it around a nice bow. And that's how I hunt them and create it. Very, very powerful. What does your legacy look like? Do you think about the legacy? Or like, what does a legacy look like? It's funny because, um, you know, when you make a lot of money, right? You, like, what do you do with it? You got to take it away with you. Yeah. So, you know, I always think about my, you know, my daughter. And it's not about having wealth for one generation. It's having wealth for multiple generations. And, mm. you know, all the money and all the houses and cars, and we can leave that stuff behind, that's yes. fine. But do you know something, something far more valuable is what's in our head? So when my, you know, when you speak to the lawyers and you create your trust and, you know, who you're going to leave to who, actually all the money stuff's not that important. What's really important is this hard drive. This hard drive is basically all my knowledge, all of my strategies, all my thoughts, because I want my kids, my kids, kids, my kids, 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 kids for generations to come to go, like, you know, you know, gr grand, granddad Lee, granddad <laughs> Lee, how did he think? Yeah. How did granddad, great, great granddad, great, great, great granddad think? Yeah. So now they're going to have to take this stuff and one day they're able to put that into AI. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Elon's making robots now, yeah. right? And now you have, I used to work in the film industry as well, so he's been an animator. So I know that they can make real life skin mm -hmm. that you can map onto a puppet that looks real. The only thing that's missing now is what? A brain. Where does the brain come from? AI. So in the future, you'll be able to take these hard drives, put it into a robot and synthesize yourself. Now you, be, you can live forever. Wow. That's where I see the future is going to be. And so we're not that far off. Yeah, that's right, actually Look at so how fast um, AI has yeah, grown it's growing. so far. It's crazy. It can, yeah. it can draw the car. It can actually put all the mind and you know, data and everything and, and replicate you. Well, I mean, not, there's so many, um, a, for example, like voice synthesizers now. So you know how like these chat GPT softwares, yeah. these, these NLPs are working. You, you have to train it. Yeah to basically speak like you. Yes. Like, for example, um, like voice cloning, for example. Yes. Right, so you, you press it, you speak into it, you give it a few words, and yeah. then any word sentence you write now, it can talk in your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you get to that level, and that, and it will, it'll be a matter of time yeah. when like quantum computing eventually gets, gets, gets brought in, we'll speed up the entire process, so everything's just super fast. Yeah. And everything will be seamless. Yeah, I, I was really, really surprised, like one person who was a very good friend of yours, mm. You know, he creates video and his, his team actually tests the 20 different lines using the AI with his voice and they test it out, different, different things. Yeah. It's already here. Yeah. I mean, in the future, you'll be able to create a funnel by saying, give me a landing page and put these ads on these platforms. Make sure you have the emails that go out every single day. Make sure you have a call to action. Wow. Make sure you tag and detag. You can just talk and it'll build it for you. Wow. I cannot you know, imagine this. It's already happening very it's soon. It's become so easy now. Now it's not about skill set acquisition. Yeah. It's about prompt set acquisition, mm. knowing how to train it. Mm. But to do that, you have to know what it is in the first place. So, so you still have to go through that process. So is this how, I'm, last question, is this how you can be still valuable in spite of having this technology? Because a lot of people are worried that no AI is going to replace us and all that. How do you still stay... So here's the thing, right? You know, as an entrepreneur, the problem is once you've solved the problem, mm -hmm. it creates another, it cre once you've solved the problem, you come up with a solution, yeah. it creates another problem, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, yeah, I, AI will replace a lot of jobs, but it'll also create a lot of jobs. It'll create a new um, job title. Mm -hmm. You know, now you've got the CEO, the CFO, the CTO, you'll also have the you know, CAIO, 
right? You'll have the, you know, you know, the chief strategy officer. You'll, you'll have the chief heart officer as in connecting. So all these new titles will be created, which means it will create new training, new jobs, and it will just keep evolving because, yes, this has solved an issue, but it's caused another problem. Okay, data sets, it still needs to be checked. Okay, you run AI through that as well. So you do a triple check. Does that really make sense? Because mm. the no problem with AI right now, it will just basically put a word in front of it. And sometimes you don't know if it's telling the truth or not. So just take it with a pinch of salt. So it will replace jobs, but it will create even more jobs. Powerful, powerful. This is the wrap of the podcast, Passion Builder Podcast with amazing, legendary John Lee. John, where they can find you if they have to connect with you, learn from you, buy any insight and knowledge, what is the best place they can benefit from you? Yes, really simple. If you're watching this, go to johnlee.com. I've got a lot of information. And then, of course, um, I have a lot of stuff on social media as well. So they can find me on Instagram. Just type in John Lee. You see the blue verified check mark on all the platforms. And if you've got a question, send me an email at john at johnlee.com. There you go. We'll leave all the details in the description as well. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next podcast. Stay amazing. Create your legacy. Don't just be ordinary. Be legendary. This is Dave Gadri signing off. Take care.